Su Jin. Um, I currently serve as the events manager at the Gospel Coalition, and I am here with Ruth. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Ruth Jo Simons. I'm an artist, author, and founder of GraceLace.com. Thank you. We are here today to talk about being women in ministry, and specifically Asian American women in ministry. So Ruth, um, tell me, what do you think are some of the unique challenges that we face as Asian American women who are in you know, leadership positions or doing public ministry? Yeah, well, what I found is that sometimes you don't see it modeled in front of you. You don't really know what it could look like. And a lot of times it's tempting to think that you need to look like somebody else. Mm. Because I think as Asian American women, a lot of times our, um, our cultural context is one where we spend a lot of time listening and making room for one another. Mm -hmm. It's very community-based. And so I find myself sometimes as a leader waiting on somebody to give mm -hmm. me permission to like come in and speak. And I've learned to really have to step into that and say, hey, it's okay if I have a gentler tone and I'm not like somebody else. It's okay to mm -hmm. be myself and um, kind of step into leadership in a way that maybe isn't modeled by somebody else in a different cultural context. Yeah, and I, I even think about how growing up, like I never saw Asian American women out there yes. teaching the word, or mm -hmm. I think you mentioned you were the first Asian American woman to sell a Bible study through Lifeway, right, You're to right, publish. And right. Yeah, I didn't grow up having Asian American women who taught the word or, you know, or you let, didn't necessarily connect that Asian American women could yes, love theology exactly. or know God's mm -hmm. word. And, you know, thinking about this year, getting the opportunity to speak on main stage and, yeah. and keynote at the Gospel Coalition, that is, I hope, an inspiration for yes. so many younger Asian American women mm -hmm. who say, okay, the, the theology and understanding God's word is not limited to one group of people, yeah, you know. Uh -huh. And as an Asian American woman, you can speak authoritatively about scripture. Yes. And you can teach and you can encourage and exhort and mm -hmm. that that is okay and that is good. But sometimes it's hard to grow into that because oh, yeah. I think a lot of times culturally and depending on different families, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of what we have in common is sometimes we're raised in a community where we're asked to be slow to speak mm -hmm. and we are more quiet and sometimes we're not quick to give our opinion unless asked. And so I think a lot of times we have to reposition and rethink, okay, my identity is in Christ. Mm -hmm. My identity is not in somebody else's approval or mm -hmm. whether they welcome me or not, but I'm going to, on the authority of God's word, step out and advocate for myself, mm -hmm. be confident that I can speak about God's word because I've studied and even if your voice is a gentle and quiet spirit, you can stand up and say, okay, I have something to say yeah. and I can take up the space to say it. Yes, and I think for all of us, like we've all had to do advocating for ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. To be where we are. And I know for me, even working in a church in a more traditional ministry yes. setting, there were times where even simple things like getting paid the same, right? right? Like yes. I had to stand up for myself and advocate for myself mm -hmm. in a gracious and gentle sure, way, absolutely. in a kind way, but still know that, you know, I can ask for this because I know that my value is there for right. the church, that right. I can provide these things in this role. And that was really hard for me. Right. Even as I was in those meetings, saying those things, there's that voice in my head that says, are you really sure that you can ask for these right. things? And I'm sure you went through that too as a businesswoman, all the things all that the you've things. been doing. Yeah. I think that's sometimes called imposter syndrome, yes. right? When we think that we're not worthy mm -hmm. of, and this, the answer isn't that we just say, well, I'm great and I'm worthy of right. it or I'm enough. It's, it, but instead it's actually to say, okay, who has... Who has God made me to be? Yes. What has he gifted me with? What am I stewarding? Because when he's given us talents and gifts and skills, we have to steward them and yes. not advocating for yourself and not bringing value to the table is not good stewardship. Yes. So instead of thinking, hey, I'm going to get what I deserve, we actually as Asian American women say, hey, I'm going to graciously and humbly but with boldness say, mm -hmm. I bring value here mm -hmm. and I'm going to request that you see my value and I'm going to make sure that you don't misunderstand that I'm not a bystander here, I'm not passive. I am going to step in and bring leadership to the situation. Yes, and I think it makes such a difference because I even imagine you've paved the path where other Asian American women could come behind you and in that publishing mm -hmm. sphere, in the business world, whatever it may be, right? Mm -hmm. There's You've kind of set that standard and I think even I think of, you know, the things that I advocated for myself in the church um, that I served at, I always thought it's not just for me. 
But for someone else coming behind me, this right. will make their life easier. They won't have to fight for these things right. if I'm willing to do it. Right. Yeah, I'm sure you've thought of that too. So much so because in the publishing space, even as an artist who wanted books that have substance, so it's not just pretty but also theologically rich, um, I had to define mm -hmm. what I was trying to create mm -hmm. because it wasn't seen before. And so it was really easy for somebody to put me in a box if I let them. Mm -hmm. But instead I said, okay, listen, just because you haven't seen it done doesn't mean it's not it's there. Done. And so just in the same way as you serving in your local church, just because that role wasn't there before right. or it wasn't perfectly defined didn't mean that it wasn't a value. It just meant that you had to kind of step out and mm -hmm. say, hey, let's imagine what this role might look like mm -hmm. and what is the equivalent that maybe you've only seen in our brothers yes. doing this role, mm -hmm. how could I step into this role in a biblical way, in a mm -hmm. in a respectful way, but to be honored in the community as a woman who is fearfully and wonderfully made yes. trying to serve in this mm -hmm. capacity. So um, for any women out there who are listening and they're, mm -hmm. they're going through that process of trying to discern where they belong, what kind of ministry yeah. they're called to, you know, what they should be pursuing. What yeah. kind of encouragements would you give to them? You know, I think so often, probably because of social media, we often see people at their arrival point. Like, mm -hmm. wow, they have that title, they have that opportunity, they're published or they're speaking on a large stage. But I often think about, and this is a topic that I'm so passionate about, I even wrote a book recently called Now and Not Yet about this topic, that there are so many seasons where we're not exactly where we want to be. Maybe we're not in the ministry that we really feel called to. Maybe we don't have the title or the role or even the acknowledgement from the mm -hmm. people we really respect noticing that we're good at this or we're called to this. And in those seasons, we need to recognize that what's worthy of being done for 3,000 people is worthy of being done for three. Yes. And so we need to start where we are with what we already have. And so for any Asian American sisters out there who are going, I want to be useful. I want to like build in God's kingdom and I want to have impact. I would say, don't think of it mm -hmm. only in terms of where you want to get to, but start where you are and say, okay, Lord, what have you already given me? Is it the children in my home? Is it the women in my church? Is it a young girl who keeps coming over in the afternoons wanting, to get my opinion on something, mm -hmm. start with what God's already yes. given you because you never know how he's going to take that full circle and lead you into a, a ministry mm -hmm. that maybe you didn't even realize yeah. that you wanted, but he's equipping you right now for what is yet yes. to come. Yes, I think that's so good. I mean, that's a little bit of my own story too because, mm -hmm. you know, I started part-time at my church and then I ended up being full-time and mm -hmm. leading this new adult education ministry, which mm -hmm. and I think on the outside, a lot of people were saying, that is amazing, right? Like I've never seen a woman lead a ministry like that or like have a full-time position like that. But behind that was years of actually mm -hmm. me just gathering two, three ladies at my church I who wanted that. to study the Bible and me starting out teaching a little bit, right. you know, informally. And then I realized, hey, I actually like teaching yeah. and I think I'm good at it yes. and starting to develop my own curriculum and things like mm -hmm. that. And that's what kind of snowballed into the pastor seeing that I'm gifted mm -hmm. in that way, the pastor seeing that there is a need at my church. Right. And I was able to come to them with a clear proposal of, hey, these are the holes in our church. Yeah. I think I can fill these holes. Yeah. What do you think? I love right? that. And that's kind of how it ended up being. And so I love that idea of you just got to start small with where you are at yes. and figure out what your giftings are, mm -hmm. what your passions are, mm -hmm. where do they intersect with the needs that are presently in front of you totally. and go from there and the Lord will surely bless those really efforts does. and will yes. use you for his will in the way that is glorifying to himself. And, yeah. and the one thing that you said that I just want to point everybody to is that you really did that in community. Mm -hmm. You weren't just off in your room going, I would like to have a ministry. <laughs> I'm going to develop it this way. And I think a lot uh -huh. of times we live so you know, digitally connected, but not yes. in real community. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting there building our kingdom ideas by ourselves yeah. when really what you said is, I started doing that with a few people. I was also um, in accountable to my pastor. I was in community with my church and I was serving in a way where even in a small way, others could come alongside mm -hmm. and affirm and yes. say, hey, Sujin, I yeah. see that you are gifted in this. See, if we do those things only digitally or only behind the scenes somewhere in our own little world, other people can't come along and say, I see this work in God, yeah. in, that God's doing in your life. Yeah. And that's such a good point because I do think kind of in this digital age we live in, and especially when a lot of people care a lot about their platform, mm -hmm. I think we tend to forget that 
God gives you gifts for the church. Yes. God doesn't just give you gifts for yourself, yes. right? Or for you yes. to grow a platform, but yes. that gifts are meant for the encouragement of the church and the body. So yes. I love that, like, you're supposed to do it in community. For sure. Yeah. And it really doesn't actually matter whether it blows up on the internet right. or not, mm -hmm. because that faithfulness with what you've been given is mm -hmm. actually that biblical picture of, you know, the, the, the talents and really saying, okay, what has God given me? How, whatever size it is, whatever platform, yes. whatever context, I can use what I already have. But the reality is, I think for many Asian American women, even that process of trying to discern gifts can yeah. be tough and it can be frustrating and it's hard because they don't know how to navigate that. And a lot of times they don't have direct mentors. You know, mm -hmm. they lack kind of, like we said earlier, yes. they don't know who to even look up to. And so do you have any thoughts on how church leaders and maybe even pastors mm -hmm. could encourage women in their congregations to really um, find their gifting and be able yeah. to be to flourish? Well, first of all, I think that our elders and our pastors, our brothers in Christ, need to always have an open door to the women in their church sharing what's going on. They need to be aware, just like pastors need to be aware of what's happening in their youth program, that this is not just some another program in the church, that it's part of the family. The mm -hmm. family, a, a dad should always know what's going on with every member of his family. And so that open door to hearing and making sure that uh, a, a sister in Christ is reading his sermons, is, mm -hmm. know, is like speaking into like how that's being received and heard. I think that's first of all, a really important step. But secondly, really making sure that the women in our churches are discipled and mentored with multiple layers of that Titus II, like the yes. older women and younger women really in each other's mm -hmm. lives and giving opportunity for that. That doesn't look like just having a party or yes, just getting together tea. to, exactly. <laughs> just, I mean, those are beautiful yes. events. I'm all for having a tea party. But what, and, and I'm all for having Bible study, but we also need to realize that relationally, mm -hmm. Developing giftings and understanding how somebody's wired, that's relational. Yes. That comes after hours and hours spent with somebody getting vulnerable and saying, I struggle in this area. These are my weaknesses, but I also want somebody to call out my strengths. Mm -hmm. I want to come and do life in a way where you can speak to the fact that this is a pitfall in my life. You know, mm -hmm. that's mentoring. That's really coming alongside somebody and more than just, I studied and here are my answers yeah. to what I studied, or we just get together for events. So we need to have a bit greater imagination yeah. for what it looks like for women to mentor women and yes. to also be spiritually a part of each other's formation. Yes. And I think, um, you know, some of kind of even pastors and elders coming alongside older women to be able to encourage and yes. equip them to do that, yes. it requires relationship there too exactly. as brothers and sisters. And I yeah. think often in churches, pastors don't always, they feel like they don't know what to do with the right. women's ministry or the women in right. the congregation. So they kind of give them a budget and say, hey, go, right? And, and that's so unfortunate. It is so unfortunate because mm -hmm. not only is a relationship that there, meaning they don't know what all the gifts mm -hmm. are in their congregation, mm -hmm. but you know, we talked about this a little bit where sometimes they can be led astray because they depend on resources outside of the church. Yes. And there's just so much out there that's not, our pastors Beautiful. need to know yes. so that the, some of the know. most influential women in yes. their church are online. Yes. And mm -hmm. I pray that I will stay firm and be solid and be an encouragement, but you, no one should follow me more than a woman that is leading within their mm -hmm. church. Because when somebody in your church is struggling in their marriage or struggling with their children, they need to immediately have somebody to go to and not just go read a post on the internet, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why we need to our pastors need to be encouraged to keep really aware of what's going on, yeah. to really be paying attention. And I love it when I get to speak at a, um, a conference, a women's conference in a church, I love it when the senior pastor or the preaching pastor, they come, he, they come in and I love when he sits on the front row and listens to what is being taught because he's the head shepherd. He's mm -hmm. the lead shepherd. He wants to know like, hey, what are the women receiving here? And I want to come alongside and encourage and, and be built up knowing that this is what's being encouraged. Yeah. Here. And I will say as an encouragement to the pastors and elders too, that women don't want to just be given a budget and put apart, no, right? Like they no. want you to walk alongside yeah. them. They want to be shepherded and they want to feel equipped in yes. their own shepherding of the women yes. of the church too. And I would say, um, I think there's a lot of cases where I think 
pastors and elders, they, they, so, they, they support women and they say, I support you, mm -hmm. but there's no tangible working there in terms yeah. of what kind of roles they're assigned to, what kind right. of work they're given, what right. kind of opportunities um, or structures even given right. to the women's ministry um, or even just any kind of discipleship among the women. And so I would really encourage pastors and elders to get practical, yeah, you know, that's and good. yeah, get mm -hmm. practical, get down on the ground and think, okay, what are the actual tangible things that I can mm -hmm. do um, to equip and empower the women who are leading these ministries um, so that they could shepherd other women? Speaking of practical, I just think one of the things that I didn't see model real well when I was growing up was that a lot of times women study one thing and the guys oh, yes. are studying something else yes. and the women <laughs> somehow study and talk about these things that end up being like only women understand mm -hmm. this and then the men study things that are only men understand. Mm -hmm. I know there's room for that for sure and there's conversations for sure for the men to have and the women to have but I think sometimes it's a beautiful thing when the entire body studies the yeah. same thing. The women, they might be reading a book or reading, you know, um, or doing a book of the Bible, but they're studying maybe even separately, but they're all going through the same mm -hmm. thing so that there is a clear understanding that even though the context and even the application mm -hmm. sometimes needs to be within the vulnerability of women in women's spaces and men in men's spaces, but the entire church and the biblical literacy mm -hmm. belongs to all. Yes. And we're walking through it together mm -hmm. so yes. that it's not like, hey, the women spend forever just doing Proverbs, but then the, the men are studying something beefy and heavy. Mm -hmm. No, we're all going to go through it together. Yeah, and I think that makes a big difference in terms of the pastors being able to articulate that and say For that sure. that is of value to our church. Yes. That makes a big difference in how the women feel in terms of, you know, am I supported in my search for like beefy biblical truth, yes, right? Or yes. is this something I just have to do on my own? Yes, yeah. so good, yeah, so, so good. good. Yeah. Well, there's a lot there that the church can respond to and we're doing our best. And I think that even with all these suggestions, ultimately, I'm so grateful for healthy churches yes. that support and encourage women becoming biblically literate yes. and serving. Yes, amen. Um, Ruth, do you just have any final words of encouragement to either the women or the men mm -hmm. in churches about how we can continue yeah. to foster healthy, biblical uh, female leaders in our yeah. churches? Well, I would say everything is all good, healthy leadership is an overflow of a healthy and good and solid life lived behind the scenes. And so if we want to see the next generation flourish knowing what wonderful roles mm -hmm. each gender can play in the, the building up of the body of Christ, we really need to invest deeply in a way where things are not cerebral, but yeah. really in the heart, that we actually grow and apply and learn how to walk in it before we try to lead all those things. So my, my encouragement to all of us as leaders is um, don't forsake a really deep and um, robust inner life because we can't, leave, we can't lead out of a shallow yeah. reservoir. We have to really be deeply rooted. So good, thank you. Thank you for joining us yeah. today, Ruth. It was a great conversation. Thanks.